that we thank you for this wonderful opportunity this evening. And to all my faithful friends and brethren in the Lord, we are giving God the praise, we are giving him the thanks, the honor and the glory for the opportunity to come in his presence. This, according to the Romans rule, Holy Thursday night. We will touch a little bit on that, but let's go forward in the name of Jesus. As we give honor, we give glory, we give praise, we give thanks for the opportunity to be able to cry out and to be able to ask of you for guidance and for directive. Go before us, dear God, in all of our appointed ways, and teach us to do thy will. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Tonight, family in Christ, the Olivet Discourse continues as headlined on, as headlined, the Olivet course, Discourse continues. So again, let's take a good look at it and see where we are and see what's happening here. Now, we do not want to get political, but we want to be correct. We also want to be wise and we want to know that we are standing where we ought to be standing. Was it Holy, I mean, Good Friday that Jesus was crucified? No, it wasn't. Because Jesus knew what was really going to happen, and he spake very powerfully according to the Bible. Matthew 12 and verse 40, and it speaks very powerful. And in those, that verse, may I read it to you tonight, so that you would have an idea of where we are going and be clear. But that doesn't give us the right not to celebrate with the rest of the world. And I think we have become so legalistic that, oh, you know, Jesus is no longer on that cross. Jesus is no longer riding in to Jerusalem on a, on a horse or a donkey. No, he is no longer doing that, but he is sitting at the right hand of the Father. And we have a great witness, Stephen, while being martyred, saw him there, according to Acts 7 and from around verse 54. You know, while Saul thought he was doing Stephen, uh, uh, what he would say, he was doing the work of the high priest, yet still, Stephen was able to convert the heart of Saul what I'm trying to show you here is how God moves, and he's been teaching even in depth. At the, the, the stoning of Stephen, and, and his face was, you know, just being martyred with stones, and you know, that's a horrible death. But yet still he was immune. God touched his soul. God touched his body. And even in, at that point in time of martyrdom, Stephen was able to smile and look up and his face was transformed and being able to say, I see Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. So I'm comforting you tonight. So as we go along, whether we celebrate Easter Sunday, whatever we celebrate, whatever day we do, we are giving thanks and let us see it as that and let us begin to explain to our people. Definitely it speaks here in in, John, in Matthew 12, and I read the fourth verse, the 40th verse, verse 40. For as John, these are the red letter edition. This really represents the, the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to the Bible. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So if we look to really get into all of these particulars here and then go into chapter John 19 and we see where the, the preparation and then the high day and, and we go into all of that, we become so political. But I want you to understand, there is nothing that we can do here more than to educate ourselves and to walk in wisdom. Let your heart, all you need is your heart. So you can sit any day of the week, and you could have your fast, you could have your Sabbath. But that doesn't mean that the Sabbath was changed. 
based on your lifestyle now you can you don't have to be on the sabbath day and again when we look back into so many legalities that we are bringing forth in the faith and confusing people and people beginning to get all manner of i call it mushy about certain things we have to understand what is happening jesus said the sabbath man wasn't made for the sabbath but the sabbath was made for man so based on our situation and lifestyle as it was so far different then to now we did not have all the hospitals we did not have all the fire stations we did not have all the things that we are having now whereby essential workers has to be on the job 24 hours so let us not try to take all of these things and bring it to this legalistic way as some are doing today but i remind you that if we have to count the 72 hours it will be from Wednesday evening until the resurrection. So it couldn't be before, it couldn't be after. Again, that is the facts of the very word of God. Three days, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Let's work with this and accept it. So again, we celebrate Friday as Good Friday. We may ask the question, what is so good about Good Friday? It's just another day. Because at that day, Jesus was in the heart of the earth. He was not yet resurrected. So we have to see this and we have to understand this, whether we want to, to accept it, yes or no. You see, we reach a point where we have to take the word of God for what it says. But there comes a time, as I would always go back on what I'm saying, you don't have to celebrate your birthday on the day of your birth. It might, it might be better celebrated or accepted a day when the family is able to gather. So we are celebrating my birthday on the 1st of July when I was born on the 20th because that's the time the whole family is coming together. So we have to see all of these things. So let us remove the politics and, and really walk according to the way of the spirit. When we can do this, we are going to find that peace. So let us see what's really happening here. Our lesson would be Mark 15. And I want you to take a good look at what is happening. And this is what happens. And this is exactly what the, what the children of Israel did. Observe as I begin to read from the very first verse of 50, the 15th chapter of St. Mark. And straightway in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. The chief priests, those who supposedly should be in authority. And this is what we are having today, you know, because we are having so much conflict this day and that day and the other day, and, and we're confusing the whole situation whereby if we would come together, regardless of what day you come together and you join your heart and mind with our Lord and Savior in Jesus Christ, he said, where the two and three are gathered, he said, I am in the midst and this is to bless. So why are we making all of Estara and this and Easter? And it was, you know, the, the time that Easter was pronounced in the Bible, it was to declare a Christian movement whether it means a star or king, what, whatever we're talking about. But I'm seeing here that we need to show the love of God. You know, like Palm Sunday, we condemn all these days because we become so over-righteous now. And I'm saying to you, we need to remove ourselves from this and let us focus on the cross. What was Jesus teaching us? He was teaching us that he is aware of all things. He know what is going to happen. And I think that is, that is in the, the, the 18th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, where he, he knows all things. He, you know, he don't have to ask when and what. He knew what was coming. And he was prepared for that. And this is what we have to do now. Prepare ourselves for the kingdom that is ahead of us. Prepare ourselves to enter into that area of life that is eternal. 
And let us remove ourselves from all the legalities and let us look to Jesus. You see, the Jews, I want to share something here with you tonight that is very important. The Jews sold out their authority. They reached the point where they cannot make decisions for themselves. Where they are now being ruled by the Gentiles. And in some of the scriptures it said the Gentiles were the Romans. In some of the scriptures it said the Romans. In some other scriptures it said sold out to, given over to the Gentile to be scourged. So when we begin to look at all of these things, we would realize that the Jews was no way in authority to do anything. And this is what the scripture is really sharing with us. And when we begin to understand what we are saying, what we are doing, we are going to find some peace in ourselves. It is important for us to know this. So you wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be a problem. Whether you, you, you cut down a coconut tree and you make palms and you share with your church, it might help somebody turn their lives. So why condemn this? You, you're judging everybody based on your ability or your skill, skillfulness? No. No. Let us look at two people here. In the seventh chapter of St. John's Gospel, there was a centurion who heard about Jesus. Maybe he had never seen him, but he heard about Jesus. And what did he do? He sent to find out. He sent his servants. He sent his servants. And when Jesus was about to, to enter, hear what he says. He said, don't even enter under my roof. Look at his faith. And if we as children of God being called, you know, in a certain way to walk according and led by the Holy Spirit, why are we fearful of directives? Why are we fearful of instructions? Why are we fearful of the Holy Spirit? Then somewhere in our lives, there is something that needs to be corrected. So we are looking here now. When this centurion recognized, he said, Lord, I'm a man of authority. Just speak that word. One word. And I know. I'm so big, Lord, that if I tell them, come here, they come. If I say go, they go. And if I send someone out there to crucify somebody, they will do it because I'm an authority. I'm a centurion. I'm a Gentile. But yet still, I love the message that you are bringing to us. I am thanking you for the message. I am asking you to guide us in this message. So help us, Lord. Just speak that word. Just speak the word. And you would look here now and see what Jesus is doing. You would also look at the woman with the issue of blood. So as children of God, under the anointing, and I want to say to you, what we have now, they hadn't it then. Not even the disciples. You know, I just feel to talk to you tonight. Not even the disciples, but he was training his disciples so that they would be able to develop their spiritual foresights. And how could they do this? Only through exercise. So look at what we did. He about to enter his last week upon the face of the earth. He's about to enter into Jerusalem, but he is going to send his servants way ahead of him because we are on this journey together. He said, go on up. And when you reach up there, you will see an ass and its colt. Loose him and bring him. And if anybody should ask of you, why do this? Say the master had need of it. And immediately they will send him. Now I want you to, to could you see what Jesus is doing? We are coming on this journey. We are going from La Romaine to San Fernando, walking. And for some reason, I tell two of you to go right ahead. Go on. You know I have not been there. You know I have no phone. In those days, they didn't have phones. So we can't say he made a phone call and he say, well, look, when they come, if it, no. They didn't have phone in those days. But what they had was a spiritual awakening. And this is what Jesus was doing to his disciples. He was bringing them to that point. So as they reached there and everything was just as he said, 
They returned with good news. Lord, just as you said, it happened. What was Jesus doing? And the way in which he called you, or the way in which he called me. Sometimes you don't even understand it. You have to go to someone else to explain it. And this is important for us to see here. So we are being led into a kingdom, but to be into that kingdom, you have to be spiritually wise. And today we are denying everything that the Holy Spirit desires to lead, to teach us. So as you look at whoever went, they didn't tell you it was Peter or James or John that went to collect those, those two animals. And I said two animals because the scriptures say a colt and its ass had an ass, you see? And it so happened. You see, Jesus was trying to bring that spirituality out of us. And this is what he was doing here. And you would observe when we sell out. Because we want to be like everybody else. Rather than to be led and guided by the Holy Spirit. This is a serious area. You know, we don't normally talk like this. But this is what is on me here tonight. And we have to be very careful. You see, they sell out their authority. You see, Annas was the high priest, or if you want to call it the anointed high priest of the Jewish people. We have Cephas who became now the political high priest. And we are seeing this today. The political high priest, because he was able, the Romans were able to use him for their benefits. But eventually, even when they captured Jesus, they still take him directly to Annas and then to Caiaphas, or Cephas, as you would call it. Then to the council, the Sanhedrin council, according here, where they had this great consultation. The chief priest held a great consultation. This is where the Sanhedrin council, made up of 70, the, Sadduc the scribes and the the Sadducees and the Pharisees, made up of 70 people, they could not come to a decision because their authority was taken away. And when we give up on our spiritual ability and, and, and the, the questions that we need to ask and to, to seek God the way in which we need to seek him and giving up on our spiritual ability, you know, we don't even believe in dreams anymore. We don't even believe in revelations anymore. We sit there and, you know, we would see people dying and you wouldn't even reach up because God is good. All I want is the word of God. And we have to be very wise here. Because God is calling us to do something. Children awake, watch and pray because Jesus is coming again. Why do we have to sell out our, our rights? Or why are we selling out our rights? Because we want to be like everyone else. And this is what you would see in this first verse here, if we understand it. They could not do anything. They were weakened to the extent all they knew they wanted to do was to crucify our Lord and Savior. Why? Because their good and welfare was challenged. Their big philaterals and, you know, all the walking, all this pumps and vanity, and they could speak big things. That was challenged because our Lord came preaching salvation. Our Lord came preaching forgiveness. Our Lord came preaching love. Our Lord came preaching repentance. This is not what they wanted. Our Lord came telling us, you see that animal you're killing every year? You see them animals you're hiding in the back there and going and bathe yourself in blood and all this kind of thing? And then you're coming out here with a white coat or, or, and, and you're pretending to be? He said, I am the bread of life. He said, I am the bread of life. And you would recognize that they could not even receive that according to John 6. When he said, they said, this is a crazy man. 
even that they will say about you? And we know that there are those who are still doing these things and sitting in high places and pretending to be. And we have to be very careful. And this is what Jesus came, con di I mean, directly opposing all of these things. And in one of the scriptures, he said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? And this is what we seek after. There are those who are looking for position. As I heard one said, the garments mean nothing. The garments do mean something if it is worn as given. If it represents, if you, when you wear it, you represent the office that you are holding. It do mean something. Aaron couldn't go on the altar just, you know, we want to just dress anyhow. But Aaron had, and his sons had to be robed in a certain way. And the scriptures say, according to Exodus 28, that their nakedness be not shown. This is what Jesus came doing. Observe how John saw him on the Isle of Patmos. A white robe with a, a golden girdle around his waist and, you know, flowing down to his feet. Nothing physical being shown. Why? Because he is the savior. And he came for a particular purpose. And that was to give us life. Something that we had, we had given up on. He came to reinstate us. So again, as I said to you, when we sell out to the world, this is where we end up. The Jews sold out to the Gentiles. And it's something that you have to get and understand. Who are the Gentiles? In one of the Bibles, it says, the Gentiles, he didn't say Gentiles, he says sold out to the Romans. And then in the next Bible, it says sold out to the Gentiles. We have to be able to understand and search these things so that we can really bring some peace in ourselves, in our minds, and in the heart of those who are seeking to know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is why now you would observe the second verse. They, 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 they delivered him up, delivered him to Pilate. And hear what Pilate is going to do now. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? I'm reading the second verse of the 15th chapter of Mark. Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answering said unto him, Thou sayest. Today what I'm observing is that we are trying to give answers to things that we cannot give answers to. And we are condemning things that we have no understanding of. And we are walking in a way, of, you know, as, I don't know. But we have to be very careful here. Observe how Jesus answered. You know, we have become so cute even in the, in, in the ministry that when someone asks a question or questions the manner in which we answer, and sometimes we are trying to give answers that we have no authority to give. But what we see here, Jesus said, thou seest. Now, if a child come to you and ask you, are you so-and-so, this is not how you would answer. But you have to ask, answer him, because that child is seeking. But this is our Lord and Savior being judged by the Romans, being judged by the Gentiles. The Roman and the Gentiles are the same. And when we study the, in the book of, the very book of Luke, and we see why Caiaphas or Cephas was known for his for the office and what he really represent, excuse me, he did not represent the children of Israel, but he represents, represented the Roman. He became the Roman representative. And the chief priests, hear what is going on in the third verse? And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered them nothing. How many times 
you're accused and you know so many things are being said about you and all you have to do is to look on the faces of some of the people and you would see and you would know what is happening sometimes when the holy spirit you don't even want to be around them but you gotta you gotta be there because the wheat and the tears have to grow together until the day of harvest and as the scripture says had it been a stranger i could have had borne it but my own familiar friend the one who dipped his hand in the cup with me the one that we sat at the same table the one that we had sweet conversations the one that I used to take with me in the Garden of Gethsemane, hence the reason he knew where I was. The one that I shared my life with. My life investment. Now this is the same one that is betraying me. But yet still, we have to address them as friends. And this is what Jesus said, friend, he could have called Judas so many different names. But how did he address him? He said, friend, what am I saying to you? Be kind to your enemies. Love them. <clears throat> if they're thirsty, give them water to drink. And if they're hungry, make sure that you feed them with a free heart. You do not give them something to eat or drink and say, well, I, I'm, I'm hoping that it choke you. No. Don't do that. But your kindness <clears throat> will heap coals of fire upon their heads. And I want you to understand what it means. It doesn't mean fire go burn them in that respect. But their conscience, according to the, to the epistle of John, when your conscience condemn you, you are well condemned. Sometimes, you know, I look at people and they could hardly look at you. And even, even though they're looking at you, they're forcing to look at you in the eyes. Because they know what they did, they know what they have said. And they are aware of how kind you have been to them. Sometimes they cannot even come around you. They are ashamed to come around you. But be kind. Be loving. Because this is what Jesus taught us. Observe how he addressed Judas. Friend, why did you do this? Not as we would get angry. So when you are looking here at who accused Jesus, Jesus, why are we going through it like this? Because I just, I think this is what we need sometimes, rather than the old familiar way. Let us seek to understand what the word is speaking to us. Look at who was abusing. Look at who was condemning. So sometimes, again, I say to you, my brethren, you know, you, you may be doing the best and you know that you are doing the best. But because of certain situations in life, there are those who are afraid of, of you. They claim not to be afraid, but they are. You know, you would be in a certain place and they would avoid you saying anything because they figure that, Everything you say is, but if you are speaking the truth, speak on, my brother. Speak on and let God have his way. Because these, what you would call, I would call them infidels here. These, and it says here, and the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered them nothing. Sometimes, you know, I, I see I sit in places already and they would just have you sitting there, you know, and you say nothing but that's all right you don't have to you don't have to because the enemy tells a tale on himself and this is exactly what is happening here and Pilate asked him again in the fourth verse saying answer us thou nothing behold how many things they witness against thee and I, I can tell you it's not a happy moment. But I'm, I imagine what he was saying in his heart. For hence the reason he had the last cry, Father. And he cried out the last cry of Jesus on the cross. 
We have to understand these things. And as we begin to understand and, and walk in them and accept them, Jesus answered him, listen, see how many, even the innocent man, even the Gentile man is now saying, and Pilate asked him again, answer us thou nothing? Behold how many things they witness against thee? But Jesus yet answered nothing so that Pilate marveled. Sometimes your life is better you stay quiet, it's better you, you, you shut up. Sometimes you might say the wrong thing. You might say something that is not convenient to situations and it can only make it worse. So let us understand what it is and where we are. As we observe here now at the feast, This is, this is deep, you know. This is the high priest that is about to condemn Jesus. That is about to sentence Jesus. I read from the sixth verse. Now at the feast, he released unto them one prisoner, whosoever they desire. The prisoner that the Jews desire is going to be released. Observe what it says here. And there was one named Barabbas, which laid bound with them that made insurrection with him who had committed murders and insurrection. And we, we understand what insurrection means. You're, you're coming against the government. You're coming against the state or the city, wherever you are. And this is a man that is going to be released in the place of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But he could not be released, our Lord, because he had a price to pay. And that price was what? To give him the power of reconciliation to revive us, to bring us back to that point whereby we can cry out, Abba Father. Without his death and burial, we had no authority. We were not able to come before the throne of grace. And this is what he came condemning. To give you a way, a path, that you do not have to come every year to the high priest with a he goat or a turtle dove or a pigeon or a fowl cock. You do not have to do this because the price is paid once and for all. This is the purpose of his coming. I want you to see that this is the purpose of his coming. So I'm saying to you that he could not be released. So Barabbas had to be released, or whoever else they had chosen. But you call here now, you release an insurrectionist. You release a murderer. And you condemn the innocent man. But the high priest didn't care. Even Jesus asked them, he said, if you're going to con condemn me, what are you condemning for, me for? What about my works? Haven't you seen it? I've made a blind man see, a lame man walk, I've raised the dead after four days. You see, they're going to bury a man, and I withstood the, the cottage, and I said, come forth. You see, I raised Lazarus' daughter. All of these things were done in your very eyes, and you never came against me with lantern and with staves and with swords. But the time has come. Jesus knew that his hour was come. Jesus knew that he had to pay that price and that price couldn't be paid by anyone else. I want to read that verse for you so that you would know that I know what I'm talking about. I'm reading from the 18th chapter of, of Luke. 
of John, as a matter of fact, the fourth verse of the 18th chapter. Jesus therefore knew all things that should come unto him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? You see, Jesus wasn't walking in doubt, and this is what spiritual calling, this is what, when we are called to a spiritual journey, when we are called to walk in a certain kind of a way, this is what is required of us. God is going to direct us. So if we are considered to be spiritually inclined and not receiving and do not even believe when a message is sent, something is wrong. Something is wrong. And we have to be very careful with that. In the, even in this time, they're going to allow the insurrectionists to go and they will destroy you. Because Jesus himself asked the question, or the hymn writer put it in words, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? Well, family in Christ, I want you to know that there is a cross for every one of us, just as there was a cross for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The idea here is how convinced are you and how, how submitted are you to the work of faith? You know, we, I, I don't want to come here with all this. Service. I want you to get this message here. I want you to get this message here. So when you feel left out or you feel cast aside, even in the congregation, even when you know that I have done my best, I have given all that I can, and your giving wasn't good enough, don't give up. But hold on. Look at what we continue here in the 8th verse. The very people that spread their garments on the donkey, on the streets, throwing palms on the street. And all of this, this is why I say sometimes it's good to, to bring these things back and let the people understand and walk with it. It's history. You know, I, I remember the children of Israel crossing Jordan. The last time they're going to eat patch corn. And as they're about to cross the Jordan, the river overflowing its banks. And in so going, the moment, you see, God had always been teaching us something that is beyond us. The moment that the Levites, who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant, that is in Joshua 5, the moment that the, the Levites' feet touched the water, imagine Jordan River, so chilly and cold, it coming down with real power overflowing its back. And the moment that the Levites, who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant, symbolizing the presence of God, feet touched the water, the waters formed a pillar. And Joshua instruct them to stand and then call for 12, an elder of every tribe, to come back and take up a stone. And take that stone to the other side, take it into your camps. But hear the words of God, that when your children, children, children ask you, what meanest thou these 12 stones? Remind them of your journey and your crossing into the promised land. So when we continue to reject those things that are symbolically, symb symbolic and also carry a spiritual significance, we are not doing our children justice. We are not helping them. And we need to help our people so that we can reach where we need to be. So when you take up these 12 stones, carry them into your camp. And when the children, the generations to come, should ask the question, let them know the journey that you have taken, the price that you had to pay, the experiences that you had. Let them know. And this is where we are falling short today in our political way of doing things and denying the Holy Ghost from sharing 
with us. Look what it says in the 8th verse of the 15th chapter. And the multitude crying aloud began to desire him to do as he had even done unto them. Listen. This is what is going to happen here. And the multitude crying aloud began to desire him to do as he had done unto him. But Pilate answered them, the ninth verse, but Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him up for, it. observe this word here, observe this word here. And this is something that we are going to experience as we go along our spiritual walk and our journey in Christ. That kingdom message. Observe this word here. For he knew, Pilate knew. What did, he, listen, allow me to read it. For he knew that the chief priest had delivered him up for envy. Envy is as cold as the grave, you know. And we're going to say, I love you, I love you. Don't tell me you love me. I love you, I love you. You know I love you. I wonder. And they, those things stay with me for a while. Because this is, what the script, this is what our Lord is facing here. Why are we afraid to deal with these things? And as I read to you in... in John 18 and 4, for Jesus therefore knew all things that should come upon, come unto him, come upon him, went forth. He didn't shy back. And this is why sometimes you don't want to go certain places, but you do it anyway. Because you are doing God's will. For envy. This is why even the Gentile knew that the reason why they delivered up Jesus unto him was for envy. Jesus was cutting into their bottom line. Let us start talking real talk here. Jesus was cutting into their bottom line. Jesus was making known unto all the people. And this is why today sometimes we stand and we condemn you know, certain garments, but certain garments were given for a reason. The garment of praise, the garment of heaviness, you know, it was given for a reason. But today we make it a style. It's no longer serving its rightful purpose and we need to be able to stand back and let God have his way. So again, why are you being persecuted? It's envy, and I say to you, envy is as cool as the grave. You envy that brother or sister because she can sing. You envy that brother or sister because he can preach and sing. And you do not even have the voice to preach. But you know something? While that brother is preaching and singing, God is using you now to do something and you are working in the spirit but you know that brother can't work in the spirit but God is using you to propel him so that he could go on and you are not satisfied with what you have gotten from God but you want to be like him and I'm calling out to you tonight maybe it's a different message maybe you expected a different message but I'm sharing with you how we walk and the things that we experience Pilate knew this. And sometimes when you are being persecuted, I want you to know that there are those who, who are aware of why you are being persecuted when you are being sidelined. There are those who are sitting there and whoever he or she may be that is sidelining you, not realizing that people are watching them. You do your best. You are not the one that is being watched. They're watching why you are being sidelined. Because of envy. 
Let, can I read this verse again? Sometimes you're on a job. Sometimes in your very home. Your brothers envy you. Your sisters envy you. Because you might have a little more intellect and your father pushing you because he want to help you. He see you could do it. And they figure he likes you more than them, not realizing that he is observant of the situation. And it's the same thing in the churches. We have to be. We have to be all that God wants us to be. But envy will always be there. And this is why I said, you know, a while ago, someone said, build your pride, be proud of it. I don't want pride. If pride is going to re re rule my, listen, my will, pride must not rule my will. If we understand what it means, what pride really means, when pride ruled your will, this is what happened to Satan, that he couldn't even return and say, Father, forgive me. And Jesus didn't only cry out on behalf of himself. He cried out on our behalf. This is where we lack pride. We don't need pride. We need faith. We need hope. The substance of faith. The substance of things hoped for. We are walking in hope, knowing, listen, as I always say, I'm not pessimistic, neither optimistic about the spiritual Baptist faith, but I'm hopeful because I know them young ones coming behind and them old ones going to die. And if they, want, they, they don't want to hand over, well, then God is going to do what he has to do, including me. I have to move on at some date. And someone is going to do better than I did. Paraventure, they might look into what I've, I've been sharing. It's okay. And grow. And better it. Say, well, you know, he could have said it like this and he could have changed it. I don't care when I'm gone. I can't do anything about it when I'm gone. But you know, even those elders through the Holy Spirit confirms the work that you are doing when you are doing it well they speaks to you you hear with the saying the anthem i shall not die i shall live forever it's only the body but there is a place beyond this life there is a life beyond this life and that is what we are preparing for this is why we call it the kingdom's message so we got to be ready for that Jesus knew where he was going and he knew why they came against him for the sake for envy. But look at what is going to happen here. The 11 verse. But the chief priests moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. While they wanted to kill Bar Barabbas in the 8th verse, you must be able to see that. But yet still, there is a way of influencing. There is a way of creating a, a, you know, situations that is not compatible to righteousness and causing people to fall short. And you know, today we have something that we call a critical thinkers. We don't want critical thinkers because if, you know, a critical thinker is gonna tell you you're wrong. He's gonna tell you the right way. He and all might be wrong, but again, he's gonna challenge what you are doing. And you don't want to be challenged because I am the rock of all I survey. No, this is not how Jesus operated. But this is how the high priest, and we are still seeing that today. But the chief priest, not only the high priest, but the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Barnabas unto them. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will we then that I should do unto him whom ye called? You are going to be challenged. Whom ye called king of the Jews. And they cried out again, crucify him. Crucify him. 
crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why, what evil had he done? And they cried out, The more exceedingly crucified. We are not even able, you know, sometimes they don't like somebody, but what did the person do? What did they do that you don't like them? We, we are trying to reason here together because this is what the word of God is doing. As you supposedly going to celebrate Good Friday, which tomorrow. So we're preparing you here. But as I said to you, Jesus was already crucified. If we consider this week, Holy Week, Jesus was crucified last night. And if he has to be within the, the grave, for 72 hours, well, the only time you can count is from yesterday evening onto the resurrection morning, you are going to get 72 hours. So our hearts need to be in that right place. And they, you know, they cry out again, crucify him. And again, Pilate observe the Gentile the Gentile was willing to let Jesus go because he understood that Jesus had done no wrong. The 15th verse. And so Pilate, willing to contend to the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. He knew this. He said, what has he done? Nothing, and as I read for you in this verse up here, the 10th verse, for he knew that the chief priest had delivered him up for envy. And I want you to recognize envy. You, I mean, oh Lord God of Israel, what are you envying me for? Because, because I could sing a little bit? Because I might bring a message a little bit? You know, sometimes you might stand up and you might preach in the church and, and nobody move. And that little fellow who could come and, and move somebody, you're watching him and you, you're trying everything to put a stumbling block in his way. This is what they did to Jesus. This is exactly, you feel the high priest didn't recognize that when Jesus went into a home or into a village, how many people fed? You feel the high priest didn't know that Jesus fed over 7,000, 5,000 people, men and women, with five barley loaves and two fishes? What all in that I was sharing with you earlier, that Jesus was trying to help us to move beyond the physical that we can see and behold the spiritual and walk in that. But we rather to stay where we are. There is something in the spirit they call inertia movement. Means that when I'm sitting, I'm sitting. And when I'm moving, I'm moving. Sometimes I could be moving spiritually and you don't even know. And we look at the, the, the chariots with the four cherubims. But when they move, when they stood still, they stood still. But there is a unison in their movement that when they move, they move. It's not a moving and one pulling back here, but they're moving. No, there is a movement. That is, that is a movement. You need to understand that. And this is why it's called inertia movement. When I'm sitting, I'm sitting. And when I'm moving, we're moving together. And they all carried four faces with eyes all over, even the wheels. We're talking spirit here. As though some of us, you know, we pray this, when we hear the book of Ezekiel, we don't even want to study that. You don't even want to hear Ezekiel because Ezekiel is a bad man. I want you to know something. Let's think again. Let's understand where we are. So Pilate had no choice. And this is what Jesus said. They handed over to the Gentiles to be scourged, to be beaten. So Pilate is the one now that is going to give him over. Hear what it says in the 15th verse. And so Pilate, willing to contend to the people, he also, remember what they said to him. If you will release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. So he had no choice. 
to get where they need to go sometimes, you have to sell out somebody else and sometimes you're selling the innocent man. Jesus' life was speaking to us in so many different ways. For his goodness, he was crucified. For his love of humanity, he was hanged on a cross. And for that cleansing power, he was pierced at his side that water and blood flowed. And we have to be able to see these things and understand that to the end, even the very centurion cried out, truly, this man is the son of God. Truly, he is the son of God. You know, and as we go into our next lesson on, uh, on, on Sunday, in the name of Jesus, we will look at what the death of Jesus brought forth. And we could learn a little more about our spiritual calling and anointing and who we are as a people and why it is important for us to walk being led by the Holy Spirit. And the more you walk and seek to understand the way of the Spirit is the more your spiritual eyes are going to be open. I say, the more you walk, seeking to be led by the Holy Spirit, is the more your spiritual eyes will be open. Our spiritual eyes are blinded because we, you know, we we'll read this and we just accept this. And we don't even go a little deeper into this to understand why it, this is being seen, said. Look at the 16th verse of the same 15th chapter. And the soldiers led him away into the judgment, uh, into the hall, call, into the hall, call, particularly, particularly, yeah, and they, they call together the whole band and clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put on his head. They clothed him in purple, and they plaited a crown of thorn and placed it on his head, not realizing what they were doing. And they called him, and they smote him on the head with the reed, and did spit on him, and bowing down their knees, and worship him. Now let's, let's think about this not realizing that this is a true king not realizing that this is a true son of god and this is what happened in 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 brazil a while ago they begin to mock christ and this is a serious area here and in their mocking of christ in their revelry carnival and have him hanging on a, and did you know that same man had to be in the hospital for a few days Yes. Two days after they went through all of this, worshiping the enemy, whether it was art form or however they take it, you don't play with God. You don't challenge God. And if those of us who had seen it, it was a real embarrassing thing to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And you don't play with God because there's a price you gotta pay. They took him with a pitchfork and they, this big satanic idol that they're worshiping. Now, it takes a lot of research for them to do that too, you know. Don't feel it was just done. No, it takes a lot of research. A lot of things that they were doing, a lot of things that they were entertaining, but the price. But the good thing in the death of Jesus, on that cross that we are seeking to celebrate now, not what they did then, but what we are seeking to celebrate now is that he had given us the authority through the Holy Spirit. And this is why he said, if I didn't go, the comforter wouldn't come. But if I should go, he will come and he will bring you into all things, knowing all things that I had not time to share with you. He will teach you and believe him. He said, whatever he shall say unto you, 
he shall not speak because he feels to speak but whatever he says what he would hear from me and that is what he will share with you so I'm asking you today to think again and let us see what is happening let us walk with God in beauty and in holiness trusting him for grace and for mercy and bowing down not as they did to mock him you would observe in this 19th verse they genuflect they mocked him not realizing that this is the savior of the souls of men and how ignorant we can be sometimes this is why we have to bring ourselves to the point that we can give God the praise so may God bless you all may God make his face to shine upon you and in your fasting those of you who are not going to eat meat until three o'clock tomorrow hey do what you have to do there is not a problem you know we love to hold on and criticize too many things if that is your fate some of you who have not eaten meat for the past 40 days God bless you what you are doing you are purging and cleaning your system nothing wrong with that but if you whatever you do is not for Harry or Tom to see but it must be to praise God so while you are off the meat ask him to purge you ask him to cleanse you ask him to make you all that God wants you to be so I'm not here to tell you well you cannot do this or you cannot do that no whatever we do let's do it with limit and to you if you eat meat all through the it has nothing to do with your salvation absolutely nothing to do with your salvation so don't go away there believing well you know and, and feel guilty no all God is seeking from us is our heart and he said it give me your heart and I will give you a kingdom so may God bless you may God prepare for you may God make his face to shine upon you and tonight I wish you peace in the almighty name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and may his Holy Spirit rest and abide with you and those of you who are going through your novenas go on trust God love him with all your heart God bless you all good night